legal. It's an idea way outside mainstream political discussion, but that shouldn't count against it. After all, four million people a year are reckoned to use illegal drugs. A million use Class A drugs alone, the most serious. Drugs are thought to be responsible for at least half of all property crime. In the next half hour, we'll test those arguments. First, though, a quick reminder of the world depicted in the film. The drama set out a Britain of the future in which the government had decided to legalise drugs due to the apparent failure of what has undoubtedly been a long and expensive war against drugs. In this new post-prohibition era, most drugs are readily available. Cannabis is on sale at tobacconists. Ecstasy and other mood-enhancing chemicals can be bought openly from pubs and clubs. Heroin is available on prescription from clinics. Typical. They realise they can't get rid of it. Start giving it away. Nick my best customers. Look on the bright side. At least it keeps the likes of them from mugging your mind. Most striking, perhaps, is that pharmaceutical companies can now manufacture recreational drugs, raking in huge profits. Regulating the new industry is off-drug, which licenses producers and the venues where drugs can be sold. They lay down the rules for labelling and ingredients. They also set the price. All of these are intended to make drug use safer and take the power away from the dealers and suppliers. The issues raised in the drama highlight the failure of a current policy of prohibition and push forward the argument for legalisation, the central tenet of which is drugs are too dangerous to be left in the hands of criminals. Would such a change really reduce crime? Or would it encourage more people to take drugs, resulting in higher rates of addiction and further human misery? Well, now to take the argument on, two advocates of legalisation, Danny Kushlik, whom you saw in the film, and from Brussels, the former European Commissioner, Eminent Bonino. And two who think we ought to keep drugs well outside the law, the former so-called drug czar Keith Helliwell and Andrew Johns, a forensic psychiatrist who works with drug users. We're going to tackle the subject through two chunks. Later we'll discuss whether more people would use drugs if they were legal. But first, what effect would legalisation have on crime? Now, Keith Helliwell... Four million people said to use these things a year, a million Class A drug users a year. Prohibition has clearly failed, hasn't it? Well, I don't like the word prohibition. We don't say well, we prohibit murders or we prohibit burglaries. Well, we do. The, the we law, attempt to. No, we don't prohibit them. What we do is deal with people if they commit them. What we try and do is prevent them, and that's the basis of drugs policy in this country. All right, prevention has failed, then. It hasn't failed. Because Wait, we, four million people yes, using it, because it has failed. But if you look at the number of people who are using tobacco and alcohol, just pr principally because they are legalised, you will see, and I know it's the second part of the debate, that the numbers who use drugs illegally would go up quite substantially. And it hasn't. The policy that's currently in place only began in 1998. And that policy puts in place educational programs, additional treatment programs, additional advice and guidance, and a much more sophisticated way of dealing with the problem. Okay. We need to give that the opportunity to be worked through. All right, let's look specifically at the effect upon crime. Emma Bonino, it's reckoned in this country that 50% of property crime is drug-related. What would be the consequence of legalising drugs? Well, I think that uh, uh, they will be extremely reduced, particularly if you think at uh, micro criminalities acts, uh, which is uh, people or addicts who rob uh, the people or, or uh, in the apartments just to get enough money. So, from this point of view, um, I do believe that uh, the, the sort of regulation. Uh, would definitely help in decreasing the crime which is related to high price as far as addiction and also the other kind of crimes which are much more important also which are related to drug dealers and the fights among uh, between uh, gangs uh, look at what is happening in Colombia or, uh, or uh, even now uh, starting to happen in Afghanistan, who gangs and drug dealers fight each other and, and taking uh, the society, kidnapping in some way the institution and society in, in this, in this so-called war. So I do believe that a sort of uh, a regulation will put all this phenomenon under control. I don't think there is any perfect solution for any problem but definitely, I think it will uh, uh, reduce high crime and micro crime. Danny Kushi, could you make sure, could you 
give us a guarantee that legalising would not make certain kinds of crime actually worse? The first thing that we have to do is, is, is address the, the central issue, which is the fact that we do have prohibition. The Home Office calls this prohibition, and prohibition creates crime. We know that from alcohol prohibition. What we know of legalisation is that through regulation and control, allowing the, ch the Chancellor to control the price of these substances, that you can bring them down to a level where the property crime associated with them is far lower. The entire market at the moment is gifted to organised criminals and unregulated dealers. So your so argument is a market is argument that it would reduce the price? Significantly. There would be no point doing it unless you reduce the price. And that's because that's where the crime comes from. <coughs> the, 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 the profit margins at, at the production and wholesale level are between 2,000 and 3,000 percent, which makes it very attractive to organised crime. The, the demand is, is, is probably now stable, but has increased to a level where the collision of the increased prevalence of use with, with, with an outdated model of prohibition has created this sprawling anarchic market, which we, which we need to take back. Andrew Jones, you deal with uh, people with drug problems, addicts, day and daily. Would it improve their lives? It certainly wouldn't. Uh, it's a very one-eyed view of a complicated problem just to look on it as a sort of odd economic market. If you take away the drug laws, what you're more likely to have is an increase in crime of different sort, which I know Mr Kushnick doesn't address. You see an increase in offences related to violence and intoxication. Heaven knows our high streets are tricky enough already on a Friday evening due to alcohol intoxication. We would make street and urban life more difficult. If because we encourage there would be so many people out of their heads. Because we'd encourage greater it. consumption. Could, 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 I, I, could I just come in also on this econo economic argument, which is extremely flawed? Unless, Jeremy, unless every substance that is currently illegal is made legal and available to every person of all ages who chooses to use it, then you will continue with an illegal market. And that illegal market exists in where goods are already legalised if you take tobacco. So there will be criminality behind it unless drugs so. are freely available. Of course may, so. may, may no, there will, be, please there will be a continuing illegal market. But please may I finish? Because, because you, on, on the, on the, on the <coughs> economy of this, the second thing is that many terrorist organisations in this world are funded by money from drugs. If they are grown, legally for, the, if they're grown legally for the legal market, mm -hmm. does anybody in their right mind believe that all of these terrorist organisations will say, oh dear, that's, that is a big source of income lost to us, we will look for something else. And the other argument about the price is again, please, is again false, because cigarettes on the illegal market at the moment are cheaper than those on the legal market and if the drug industry got hold of this business the prices on the streets are likely to be equal if not more once they were taxed. Why would that happen? We currently have a situation that is completely deregulated. What we're talking about is putting in place a system of regulation. We're replacing prohibition which creates the very high prices, the anarchy and the, and the criminality that's associated with these things and taking it back. Yeah, now but it's if, not if, to if say that it's... also price sensitive, why is it that when we know the price of heroin has fallen in half in the last eight years, why hasn't the level of crime okay, dropped Okay, it's really half? simple. The price of a daily habit for tobacco is a maximum of, say, five or six quid. Now, that means that there isn't any fundraising to support a habit. There's nobody currently in prison to support a, 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 for fundraising to support a tobacco habit. The average price of a, of a heroin habit, or if you add crack to it, is at least £50 a day. Now, most people don't have that sort of income. So whilst the price has come down, it's still extortionately high. These are essentially valueless products that are... That are um, the, the price of them is, is, is multiplied by a factor of at least 10 by virtue of the fact that the, that the risk applied to the market pushes that price up. Now, uh, if we regulate it, we can bring the price yeah. down and enable these things to be supplied in a way that doesn't support terrorist organisations. Emma Benina, you're trying to get in there in Brussels. Go on. Yeah, I'm trying to get in because even if uh, there is still a black market on cigarettes, let's be, be clear that there is not such a huge organisation with gangs uh, killing each other or uh, killing people because the profit is not so high. And people, in fact, at the end, or alcohol is the same. So people prefer to go in a shop and buy their own alcohol provide because they feel that it's more safe and guaranteed. So uh, let's, let's assume that it's yes. not... Uh, uh, what we are pleading for uh, is a sort of a regulation to put the phenomenon under control for the safety exactly of people. So I, uh, I, I definitely believe that the, the terrorism now makes a lot, a huge 
profit, not because of the poppy or the coca leaves, but because prohibition makes heroin and cocaine uh, with such an enormous amount of profit. So, so if you take away profit, I think that uh, the criminality will definitely decrease because there is no interest. But what, com what completely undermines that argument, quite frankly, is in this country, unlike other countries, in this country, a person who is addicted to these substances can go to the National Health Service, can receive treatment, which may be the substance itself, or more likely be a substitute substance which is likely to lead them well, away from it. Okay. Yeah, but when so therefore it is available. But how come 50% of property crime is drug related? I should have thought as a policeman you'd, be, you'd want to see that reduced. I do, want to receive, I do want to see that reduced, but a large proportion of the property crime is committed, as Danny says, by people who are addicted to it, people who will not go and seek treatment. Okay, because, keep, forgive me, happens? because no, they no, no, don't want the early. substitute drug. The, what they do okay. want is they want the real thing. What happens when you give people Method, for instance, heroin addicts, if you give people diamorphine, the equivalent of heroin on prescription, or methadone, the substitute, their offending reduces dramatically if they stick yes. to it. Now, that seems to me a very <coughs> obvious <coughs> argument, that if they stop needing the that money to supply to me, their habit... That seems to me, Mr. a good argument for treatment. And I think exactly. many of us would be keener exactly. on... But, greater nationwide availability of treatment. And, and, and I would support treatment, but insofar as it achieves the, the, the wider range that we need to, what treatment doesn't solve is the problems across the whole of Latin America. It doesn't solve the problems in, involving um, uh, the links between uh, 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 drug gangs and terrorist gangs. It doesn't deal with, with sure. the majority. I mean, so th let's stick what to we're the, talking let's stick to Let's stick to our, our own neck, neck yeah. of the woods, because at least we can, we, can, we can talk a little more precisely. But it goes far but wider than that. Of course, it, of course it does. But when Let me give some information yeah. about the effect of the treatment. The National Treatment Outcome Study that Mr. Kushlik will well know has shown that for every pound or so spent on treatment that can save up to 18 pounds down the line in criminal justice costs and the, the similar studies from other parts of the world. So treatment monies are a good investment, they are good at reducing crime and also the Swiss heroin prescribing but, experiment can, but, which Mr Kushlik also advocates has also led to a reduction Andrew, in anything, crime. Andrew, anything is better than But you cannot force tests. people the on, is, on the, treatment, excuse me. You cannot force people on treatment. Would you force an uh, alcohol addict on treatment? No, no you uh, wouldn't, but would you not. give an alcoholic addict some whiskey every week? No, but no, it's exactly. legalized. But uh, excuse me, but it's <laughs> legal. He can go and buy it. You can make a lot of campaign trying to, di to discourage it, but to, to, to alcohol addicts, you don't impose treatment on that as, as a binding way. So, uh, because that addiction is a social problem, should not be treated in a criminal way. Okay, that, well, that takes point. us very naturally to the next area, because the proposal that we stop treating drugs as a law enforcement issue and instead accept them as a fact of life has as its heart a totally different attitude to drug users. Now, we sent Richard Watson to Portugal, where they decided that the old approach wouldn't do any longer and that the way to handle the issue was to treat users not as criminals, but as patients. Lisbon, the drug's gateway to Europe. Close to the hash-producing regions of North Africa, first landfall for boats charged with cocaine. Stopping the flow is akin to damming a river by hand, and the new emphasis in Portugal is on reducing the harm drugs cause once on the streets and the wider cost to society. Portugal has gone further than any country in Europe towards decriminalising the use of drugs. If you're caught here with small amounts of even Class A drugs like heroin, ecstasy or cocaine, you're not imprisoned or prosecuted. You're diverted away for treatment and help. It's a bold new policy based on the realisation that the old ideas of prohibition and prosecution were failing. But is there any evidence it's beginning to work? Lisbon used to be the heroin capital of Europe and this, coupled with soaring HIV infections, led the government to decriminalise drugs in 2001. The city still has its problem areas, shown to us by drugs workers who wear fluorescent jackets to gain the confidence of the street addicts. How, how many years have you used heroin? Uh, 20, 22 years. 22 years. 22 years. OK. Local police believe things are getting better. If we were to hang around here for a while, we would see some drug taking, but not as much as a year ago. When users are caught, they receive a summons from the police ordering them to attend a special drugs commission, 
run by the health service. Nothing to do with the court system at all. From there, they're offered treatment and support. Has the drug situation got worse? Has it Locals got seem supportive, but there's concern about authorities turning a blind eye. The user is down here, and the police are over there. And sometimes they're injecting. And when the police come, they turn their heads to look the other way, as if to say, let them be, poor things. Funding treatment centres is pushing up the drugs budget in Portugal 10% each year. But supporters say it's delivering results. There's short-term residential care for addicts here, with help for general health as well as psychotherapy and help finding jobs. For many like Raquel, it's a chance to recover. Is this helping you here? Is it, is it Very good? Very much. <laughs> In what way? Uh, Self-esteem is high now. The worst we can do an addict is to send him to a prison because he goes to the crime university. But I mean, is there any evidence that's actually working? The difference is that now the ones who come are people in worse situations, social, even physically. That means people coming really from exclusion, social exclusion. So what do the figures show? Over the past five years, the number of drug users undergoing treatment has risen 20%. AIDS cases amongst drug users are down by 51%. And drug-related crime overall is up 7.3% over the same period. The Portuguese drug squad stresses they're not going soft on the traffickers. Seizures have more than doubled since 1995. This 15 million euro haul of cannabis resin was intercepted just last week. Police say earlier fears that Portugal would be awash with drugs following decriminalisation have proved unfounded. We felt, and the Portuguese police forces were worried, that there would be an increase in consumption after its decriminalisation. This did not happen. So drugs crime is up, but many believe it would have risen by far more than 7% if the new policy was not in place. And on the public health issue of HIV infections, decriminalisation appears to be working. So now let's turn to the second main area of concern. If drugs were to be legalised, would that mean more people use them? Andrew Johns, taking the courts out of the question of treatment for addiction is a sensible thing to do, isn't it? Not entirely. I think in the Portuguese experiment shows that they've had a good balance between enforcement and treatment responses. And you can use, well, the criminal justice system to introduce people to treatment, but that's not the only approach. We need an expansion in treatment facilities in their own right. Tanya Kuschlik, wouldn't the consequence of legalisation be that more people use drugs, and how would that be good for Britain? The fact is that use probably would rise, certainly in the short right. term. How would that be good for Britain? Uh, that, that isn't good for Britain. That's right. just... So why do, why, why do you advocate it, then? Well, the fact is that we look at a range of harms. One of them is increased use, but the other one is reduced criminality the restabilisation of producer countries, halving the prison population, <laughs> the end of, of drug-related street prostitution. Sure, but you are but conceding that legalisation would mean more people use drugs. Yes, I am absolutely right. conceding that. But the, hang on, but the, the issue is there's a wider range of harms involved here rather than just the fact that people use drugs. If, you, if we become obsessed with the issue of people using drugs, we'll forget the fact that we're destroying half of Latin America, encouraging the Afghanis to grow opium and, and, and messing up uh, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia. So this is a foreign and, and policy a lot question of money. rather than a question of domestic it, it's health, a much, is it? it yeah, no. well, it is a much, much bigger question well. than just the fact of people using drugs. It's very parochial, right. okay. in fact, Let me to stick to the issue of what goes on in the UK Fine. in terms of people using drugs. Emma Benino, um, you uh, heard that frank admission there that legalisation would mean increased use. Would you like okay. to see your children growing up in a world in which there were legally available drugs? I would like anyhow to have my children not to die of HIV related to heroin or anything else or, or uh, this kind of things. So you're happy, for, you're happy for them to have drugs wait, freely wait. available? Well, I think it's less damaging, and I'm talking of not of regulation, and I think it's less damaging just now. Listen, drugs are totally free. You can buy drugs at Christmas time. Uh, when you don't find any bread, but you can find uh, drugs everywhere for free, but very expensive and totally uh, not controlled as a substance. And let me also tell you something. When we legalized abortion in Italy, 
Evidently, in the first year, the number of legalized abortion increased. But then, and consequently, uh, and in parallel with a, a huge campaign of awareness, now abortion is declining in my country. So I mean that just to pretend that in 10 years' time, uh, consumers will increase is totally uh, scientific. Depends what kind of, of also information and campaign you do. But nevertheless, well, as I, we I don't do know the consequences, it's a rather foolish thing to embark but we do, upon. We this, do know it? some of the consequences. What? We, what? we know that the, the, the Dutch Listen, have, have had coffee look, shops selling cannabis the for Dutch a long time. And then the Dutch are now having second, second thoughts, thoughts on all the sorts Dutch of aspects have of that far policy. lower rate Maybe of cannabis use thought, than we but do. They, have not they have increased they availability and lower use. There are far more right. factors than just availability that determine the level of use. Hello, well, what? let me <laughs> So let me, let me just, also tell you something. Me, that just, just, okay, I'm going to come to you back to you in a second, uh, Mr. Benia, but uh, Keith Heller, what do you make of this argument? I mean, we've, seen, we've well, heard an admission there would be increased use. Well, of course there would, uh, and this is, this is the frailty in the argument. What they're saying is that uh, because it's, it's expensive to, to buy it on the illegal market, we'll make it legal and let, allow more people access to it and therefore control it. But, but can I just come back to Portugal, really, please, because it's laughable. Portugal have taken their model their new model of drugs from us. I spent an, a large proportion of my time with the Portuguese looking at the model we have in this country. Keith, we haven't for decriminalized many, possession forgive of me, drugs. Forgive me, for many, they call decriminalization taking th something from their legal code into their civil code because they are based on a Roman law system rather than common law as we are. The police service in this country have cautioned people for drug offenses for 25 years. People, police in this country put people into drugs treatment if they believe that drugs are the root cause of their criminality. The courts now, I introduced all of this, sentence people to drugs treatment and testing orders to keep them out of crime. The prisons treat people in prison. Work, but uh, none, of which, is it's only none just of which is reducing yeah, use, is it? Yes, How it is. Forgive me. Well, there's there's forgive no evidence me. The, the, use evidence, the evidence from the intervention into the criminal justice system of treatment yep. has been that but recidivism by those people has drug come use down. went up on your but watch listen, no drug listen. use didn't go up on my watch drug use went up after David Blunkett you, said something stupid and saying virtually giving the message that cannabis is okay that's when drug use went you, up I, up until then drug use had leveled out at the end of the 90s as was beginning but you can't to fall claim responsibility was beginning for that. to this fall bizarre. Emma Benino go on but listen first of all consume are growing and increasing now with prohibition and what is fantastic is listening to people who have been applying prohibition in the last 20 years knowing that production is increasing trade is increasing uh, uh, trafficking is increasing consumer is increasing uh, criminality is increasing and still defending the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the prohibition policies this is totally <laughs> undefendable and I think that it's high time that we take away the prohibitionist illusion and we come to term to the fact that we have to reduce harm for the whole of society. Well, the society this is, is the curious way of reducing harm. Um, yes, we, yes, yes, because if you reduce, <laughs> if you reduce I, I, HIV infection, we if you that. reduce We're criminality, we do that in this you're, country. You're, 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 talking you're, about, you're talking about a specific category of injecting heroin use. You're, we're talking here about a much, much bigger yes. category. We're talking about the, these guys are talking and about so the legalization of all the drugs. Mr. Kushnick is not only is the, 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 the demand. Let me get a word in edgeways. Go what on. Mr. Kushnick is advocating is, in effect, the little corner shop with a sign outside saying, Ease are us or Barb's no, are not. us or whatever, said that. where you go to the, your, this is the policy documents published by your organization, uh, where are you us. go to the little this, shop. This is lies. Where mm. you go to the little shop, you can purchase, as you said, um, pharmaceutically regula regulated samples of many drugs of misuse. If anyone would like to see the report, it's available online. You have right. advocated okay. that it drugs are generally available. No, and my but, argument but is that... you are in favour of decriminalisation, you're in favour of things being We're in favour of the regulation... People will get into that We trade. are in favour of the regulation... Let me just tell you that. We, we are but in favour of the regulation and control of drugs. But isn't there a flaw, in, that that isn't that there a flaw in your argument, right. Andrew Johnson? You know, if, if four million people are yeah. using these, the, these, these drugs every uh, year, um, there's no evidence really it's doing them much harm. There's a lot of evidence about harm. And I agree <coughs> the harm isn't as quick as uh, alcohol, where people get anymore. prominent things like cirrhosis. There's increasing evidence of the harm related to cannabis, which has a misrepresentation in the public eye as a safe drug. 
Um, there's measurable harm related to ecstasy and other drugs. And I think that any notion that making them more available is a public health exercise is extraordinary. So you're saying it's a leap into the unknown. We simply do not know what the consequences it's would be. It's a great leap into the dark with, I think, highly adverse health consequences for the individual and for society. Prohibition is the leap into the dark. We took a leap into but the dark. But you keep on making this comparison with prohibition. It's not and a this comparison. I can be... show you Home Office documents where right. they talk well, about it let us take, If we, why, if we take, if we take your it. analogy and say that prohibition ends mm -hmm. and we'd have a situation like alcohol in this country, mm -hmm. wouldn't then non-use of drugs be as rare as teetotalism? The question is, what do we want from our society? Do we want a society where, where people who become, particularly young women, who become addicted to, for instance, heroin and crack, are selling their bodies to strangers on the streets? Do we want a situation where we've doubled property crime, where we spend 16 billion each and every year on the crime costs associated with supporting this policy? It's more than the entire Home Office budget, where whole countries are completely destabilized. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm, I'm here arguing for the state to take back control of this thing, <laughs> Daddy, and people are laughing Daddy, at me Daddy, and telling me that this is a crazy Crazy experiment. I'm only laughing. Prohibition is the crazy experiment, I'm which has gone horribly wrong. I'm only laughing because uh, an uninformed observer would believe that the whole of this country is taking drugs. Four, not, four million well, people may have taken drugs occasionally. The reality yes. is that the majority of people in this country do not take drugs. Drugs do not sure. affect their lives. Illegal, and they do not drugs, wish the change. Yeah. And part of that reason is because they are prohibited, because the messages are and should be clear that these are harmful, they are damaging, and yes, if you are addicted to them, we will help you. Yes, we need to help and educate you to understand well, the dangers, case, it and it needs time to do that. You will have pusher for free every single day. You can make all the campaign that you want, but the high profits will make pusher uh, avail for free every day, 24 hour days, at Easter time and Christmas time. So you will not never counterbalance the fact that you will have individuals who will, to get drugs, will be pusher selling drugs to others because of the profit of it. There is something very, very important that people who support legalization never talk about, and that is Alaska. In Alaska, in the mid-70s, they legalized, not decriminalized, they legalized cannabis. Over the period of 10 years that that was in place, and they then recriminalized it, it was a disaster in that country. And there is a, Keith, there is, you know there is a, well weight, I do. There is a well, weight of research on that. that Alaska has which the most liberal cannabis laws in the whole of North America. There is a weight of research on that, which I do wish people who advocated legalization it's would see. Let me just ask you all, in one sentence, what ought to be the aim of government policy? What ought to be the aim? One sentence. Keith Hellowell. The aim ought to be for people to live drugs-free lives right. within this country. Emma Benino? No, drug-free is impossible in history. Every history okay. has had the drugs. I think that the policy is a uh, reduction of uh, harm for the whole of the society. OK, Emma Benino, thank you. Go on. The Emma policy should, should be for the government to take responsibility for the production and supply and control of currently illicit drugs and reduce harm. Reducing harm is very important, and you do that by reducing individual consumption and national consumption. Well, thank you all very much. That's it for this IF debate. Legalisation of drugs is not thus far on the agenda of any of the main political parties, but you can join the debate online at bbc.co.uk forward slash IF. Newsnight will be on in a moment, but for now, goodbye.